and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian O'Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Judge Emily Miskell of the 470th District Court of Collin County, Texas. We will discuss judging in a pandemic, among other things. So welcome to the show, Emily. Hi, I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited to have you on. Um, as you know, I follow you on Twitter and I'm a big fan. Um, but for listeners who might, to their great loss, not yet be familiar with you, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about yourself and how you became a judge. Sure. I took a kind of long wandering path to get here. Um, everyone in my family was an engineer and I kind of grew up believing unless you're an engineer, you're going to end up living in a box under the freeway. So uh, that's what I did in college. I majored in mechanical engineering and it was great. I majored in actually engines and rockets and lighting things on fire was my college major. Um, and I thought that that's what I was going to do for a job. I wanted to build rockets. And then I graduated immediately after September 11th when everything had a hiring freeze. And, uh, so I went to work in the oil business. I built oil and gas pipelines for about three years in California uh, doing a lot of environmental impact reports and stormwater plans and just all the kind of reading and writing that actually goes along with engineering projects. And um, I, I've told this joke online or joke, but story online recently when uh, the topic was, how did you decide to go to law school? And, um, you know, I was just writing all these very dry reports and this lawyer would come around every couple of weeks and just sign the things that I had written. And I had this sneaking suspicion that he was probably getting paid as much to sign my reports as I was getting paid to write them. And I thought, you know, I could do his job too. Um, so that's sort of the the funny reason that I my interest in law school was piqued. But really, I, I've always liked problem solving and um I just liked people problems more than valve problems. And so I decided to go to law school after I'd been out in the workforce about three years, went to law school. Um, during law school, I always kind of joked that I was going to move to Texas, become a divorce lawyer and wear pink suits. Um, and I think people thought I was being funny, but I think I was kind of being serious. Um, so I moved to Texas after law school. I worked in a big firm for one year doing um, intellectual property litigation because with an engineering degree, that's kind of how you get pigeonholed. And then I, I broke the mold after one year at a big firm. I quit and went to do family law, which is divorce, custody, all those kinds of things. Um, and that's what I did as a lawyer for let me added up six, seven years before I became a judge. So I tried a lot of cases, uh, a lot of mediations, a lot of courtroom time as a family lawyer. That's one of the things I really liked about it. Um, and then the Texas legislature created new courts because of our growing Texas population. And so Governor Greg Abbott appointed me to one of the brand new courts back in 2015. And then immediately I had to run for election in 2016. Uh, and I'm up for get, uh, election again in 2020. And so that's sort of the long and short story of how I came to be where I'm at now. Mm. Well, Emily, maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of what you do as a judge. Like prior to our current situation, what was your sort of average day like and sort of what kind of work were you doing? It's really interesting because being a judge is totally different than the job of being a lawyer. So as a lawyer, you're hearing from clients, you're trying to solve their problems and fix things, um, getting ready to put on a show, which is your trial. Um, but as a judge, it's totally different. Your job isn't to help or fix anything. You don't get to put on the trial. You just get to watch trials that other people put on. Um, but really one of the more interesting parts is how much of a logistics job it is. Um, it's really about keeping all the widgets on the conveyor belt. So in state court, our numbers are just massive. So for example, we're in the Eastern District of Texas for federal stuff. And I believe I saw recently, they get something like 650 cases a year per judge. Uh, we in Collin County average around 2,300 cases a year per judge. And so if you work out how many business days in a year there are, that means I have to finalize between nine and 10 cases every day I'm at work to stay even with what comes in. And so you have to have systems and procedures and policies and just for just keeping everybody on the uh, conveyor belt and not letting anyone fall off, getting people to their trials in a timely manner, having 
efficient docket procedures that appropriately encourage settlement, but also have room for all the other interim stuff you have to handle. And so um, basically what we do is we set three final trials every day. We set about six to seven other motions and hearings. So that could be discovery motions to compel. That could be temporary orders in family law cases, just a variety of whatever motions there are. And then in the afternoon, we set another three non-evidentiary stuff. So stuff having to do with orders or withdrawing or whatever it might be. And so that's a busy day. Uh, the second thing that really surprised me, so first being just, it's basically a logistics job. Secondly, how much other government stuff we have to do um, in the state court system contrasted with the federal system. So I was talking to a federal judge I know, and I was like, isn't it weird all the other like, you know, checks and balances, branches of government stuff you have to do? And he was like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you know, we got to, you know, hire the auditor. We've got to manage the juvenile descent detention facility. You know, we have all these, you know, separation of powers jobs or checks and balances. And he was like, no, I just do court stuff. And uh, so I think the other thing that really overwhelmed me at first was just how many things that in Texas, if you can't trust one branch of government with it, you give it to the judicial branch to be responsible for. So we have a lot of checks and balances duties and like generic background government work to be doing. I think as a lot of the judge wasn't on the bench, they were, you know, feet on their desk in chambers eating bonbons or something, but it's like, I have this incredible part-time job on top of my other full-time job, you know, just as a, as a elected official in our Texas judicial system. I mean, how do you think that workload kind of breaks down? And as a judge, like, what do you spend the majority of your time doing? I mean, do you find that at least in the court on which you sit, there are particular kinds of cases you see more often than others and sort of what, what sort of occupies the majority of your kind of bandwidth as a judge? So my court is uh, primarily family law cases. So I'd hear no criminal cases. I do hear child welfare cases like CPS cases. Um, and then I hear some civil cases here and there. Uh, so primarily a lot of my focus is my theory is if I can apply the rules the same in an even handed way, when you look at the rule, you can understand what it says and know that I'm going to do what it says that helps people settle their cases. And so I, I really commit that my role is to just do what the books say so that before you come in, you can kind of predict what the outcome is and that helps people settle. The second thing I think is important to kind of manage my bandwidth is to try to focus on resolving a case so that people don't come back and back and back. Um, in family law, none of the stuff we do has um, statute of limitations. So if it gets dismissed, they can just turn around and refile it, right? So we get not a lot of help from running a dismissal docket. They just come back. Uh, and then secondly, um, it's kind of an area of law in which is notorious for co-parents just fighting and fighting and fighting for years. And so we had those cases uh, where before I came along, they had been in constant rounds of litigation solidly for five and six years. And so one of my biggest um, ways to creatively think about cases is how can I do a solution that does not incentivize people coming back, that gives them an order that works, whether they get along or not, that they can just move on and just minimally coexist, you know, and, and eke out their, their post-judgment life. You know, I, I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but it, it takes a lot of creative problem solving to think of an order that doesn't involve people coming back and back and back to court to enforce or to modify or to fight over. Mm -hmm. Well, so you mentioned that prior to going on the bench, you had a family law practice. Do you think that your practice has informed your judging and sort of are other judges on your court or similar courts coming from a similar background? Like how do different people approach sort of the job that you're doing? Uh, I'll answer the first question first, which is how did my background kind of help? And um, this is one of the things I really liked most about doing family law is Sometimes in other areas of the law, you can get pigeonholed into one particular aspect of the practice. So if you're a plaintiff's lawyer, you're pretty much always representing plaintiffs. You don't go back and forth generally and do half defense, half plaintiff work. Um, same thing in criminal. If you're a prosecutor, you're a prosecutor. If you're a defense attorney, you're just 
on that side. And, and you can go from one to the other, but you're not doing both at once. Um, one of the things that I like best about family law is you get whoever hires you first. So sometimes you represent dads, sometimes moms, sometimes the alcoholic is your client. Sometimes it's on the other side. Um, you know, so you're, you're never kind of wedded to one vision of how the world is. You're always able to tell your clients, look, if I were in the other room, here's what I'd be telling them. Um, and also as you litigate just tons of cases and go to a lot of mediation, you just see how different problems are solved all the time. And so I think it really helped me because I just had a huge toolbox of different options and different things that are done because I had just litigated a lot of cases, gone to a lot of mediations, seen a lot of solutions done. And so I already knew, okay, here's one way to fix this. Here's one way to do something about this. Um, and I'm sorry, your second question was, oh, about the background of other judges. So uniquely, um, it's sort of in Texas, our urban counties have more specialization of courts and our more suburban and rural counties have generalized courts. And so the county that I'm in is in a transition phase right now. Historically, the courts were always general jurisdiction, which means they hear all civil, family, criminal, everything, one judge. And historically, many judges were former prosecutors or civil attorneys from the community. Um, and our first specialized courts that we ever got in Collin County was in 2015 when the legislature created my court and a sister court which here 100%, well, mostly family law cases and civil that are related and, you know, a little bit around the fringes, but primarily family law cases. And now the new courts that have been created since 2015 have also all been specialized. Um, so with specialty courts, you get more of a selection of, you know, who's interested in taking that job based on their background. Um, but then we still have many, many um, general general jurisdiction courts still in our county. Mm -hmm. Well, so given your experience as a judge and sort of like the years that you've been doing this work, I wonder if you have thoughts about things like you wish you knew when you were a lawyer, like that would be helpful for either like you know, lawyers who are practicing in family courts or other kind of courts, or maybe even law students who are thinking about sort of how they're going to become lawyers. I think one of the things that I was mistaken about when I was a lawyer is when I was asking for relief from a court and I would, for example, submit a proposed temporary restraining order, I would just throw everything in the kitchen sink in there and be like, well, I'll just ask for a bunch of stuff and whatever the judge doesn't want to do, they'll cross out. Now that I'm just constantly totally overwhelmed by the quantity of decisions and cases I have to deal with in a day, uh, I have really seen the truth of a quote that I like to use, which is a confused mind says no, which means that if the decision is too difficult, right, the decision maker can always just deny it, just say no. And so if you want to get your relief and have a higher chance of getting what you want, you need to make it easy for someone to say yes to you. So instead of filing a TRO with 17 items of requested relief, file one with one or two, right? It's it, The court is not going to sit there and read six pages, right? But if it's two pages with a checkbox, you're more likely to get it. And so I just, I think that I viewed things the totally opposite way when I was a lawyer. And so what I would say is make things shorter right? If I have, again, three final trials and six or seven other motions, if you give me a brief and it's 12 pages long, when am I going to read that? Am I going to take a recess and make everybody wait in a full courtroom while I read 12 pages? If you give me a three-page brief, I can read it right then and get the answer and have the information you want me to have. So um, just, you know, the classic quote about if I had had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. I think the best value that an attorney can add and I'll, and I'll sidestep here. This is one of the differences between self-represented litigants. One of the real value things that an attorney can add is most people aren't good at telling their own story. They're not good at conveying all the details in a narrative way, including important things and excluding unimportant things. And so the real value that attorneys bring is to take their clients' stories and condense them and organize them into a way that someone else can listen to and know what's important. And so I just think that is the real, real value that lawyers can add is to make things shorter, make things easier to grasp 
for a busy mind um, and not just say, oh, we'll just put in everything and then the judge can decide because then you're offloading all that cognitive work onto someone who's very overloaded. And realistically, they can always just say no. And um, that's the easiest thing of all. Mm, well, I wonder about that. So like, I mean, how do you think about the role of the lawyer as a storyteller? Has your perspective on that changed as you become a judge? And when you write opinions, I mean, do you think about yourself as a storyteller in that context as well? So typically in state court, we don't write opinions um, and that there's in our state system a disincentive to really explain a lot about why you're ruling the way you ruled. Because if you say nothing, then on appeal, the appellate court will presume that you could have considered any you know appropriate reason in arriving at your decision. But if you say what your decision was based on and it's wrong, then you know you might have to do it again. So the incentive is really there to never explain yourself. That's really interesting. And I wonder how you feel about being a judge with a disincentive to explain the reasons for your opinions. Do you think that's a good thing or something that you're uncomfortable with? I mean, I always have the ability to explain the reason for my ruling if I think it's going to be helpful, for example, in people not coming back to court. Like if they understand that I got it, that I heard all the evidence, and that just is the answer under the law, um, then then it might discourage future litigation. So sometimes I do say something about why I'm ruling what I'm ruling. Um, but for the most part, my answer is, you know, according to the facts and the law. So um I think, again, since we have such a quantity problem with 2,300 cases a year, and also my numbers, um, I went back through kind of, I did a kind of a postmortem on a 12-month period. I averaged 1.7 final trials every business day. Uh, of the 2,300 cases I got, 20% of them went to bench trial. 80% of them settled or were dismissed or whatever. And then I think it was like 0.2% were, were jury trial. Um, so, but 20% of 2,300 is a lot of trials in a year. And so I don't have the capacity to sit down and do a bespoke explanation for every case. Luckily in Texas, we have very specific statutes and we have codes and codes and codes. So sometimes the answer is just there. Oh, I know what I was going to say about, you had asked about, um, lawyers being storytellers and how, how that's useful to me or how lawyers can think about that. Um, and I think one thing I've noticed is when you are a lawyer, you are so in the middle of it all the time. You are, you've been with your clients through the whole phase of their problem coming up, the different options that were explored, the things that you were able to resolve, the things that have broken down and that's why you're in court. So you're coming to court in the middle of a whole long story that you know all about. The judge is coming to this brand new with nothing. And I know this sounds obvious, but people still aren't doing it. So for example, in an opening statement, a good thing to say might be, this is a divorce case. The parties have been married for eight years. They have two children, ages three and five. We've settled most of our issues, but what we're here today is A, B, and C, right? And sometimes lawyers just start talking in the middle of a paragraph. And I'm like, hold on, what kind of case is this? Who do you represent? Where... I'm sorry, did you have agreement on some things or nothing or all things? What, what are you trying? Is this an agreement or you're, we're setting up for a hearing? So I think really orienting the judge sort of to their, to their location and space, right? What, what kind of a case is this? What problem are we asking you to solve? Give a little intro. Who are the characters? What are we asking for? Right. They're really just basic, basic stuff. And I think that's why people tell appellate lawyers, for example, you know, give your argument to your kid or to your neighbor or whatever and see if they can follow it is because you're so in the middle of it. It's hard to talk to somebody who's a stranger to it. Mm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating and I think really helpful for people. I, I, I mean, I wonder personally, like, are there things that make particular cases hard for you or easy for you? Like, I mean, do you feel like different cases have sort of a different presentation for you as a judge in terms of like the amount of 
kind of intellectual and emotional labor it takes you to decide them? And if so, sort of how would you distinguish between those kinds of cases? So, yeah, so some cases are intellectually hard. Uh, I had a case that's um, currently pending in front of the Texas Supreme Court right now, just on a very interesting subject matter jurisdiction issue. And it had to do with a uniform um, code of different states and then how Texas enacted it and whether something was subject matter jurisdictional or not. Right. And that's just an interesting legal question. Um, and so I'll find out uh, if we got it right or not um, when the Supreme Court rules on it. And that that stuff doesn't um, I'm not offended if they do something different uh, than what I did, because, you know, we, nobody knew the answer. It was a case of first impression. And now they gave us one. Great. Um, so I would say those interesting intellectual challenge puzzles. I enjoy doing them. The tough part is to find some quiet time to sit and think about them, because basically it's just, you know, you're just zooming through everything at such a pace that quiet thinking time is quite a luxury. Um, the second type of case that are hard are, I would say, emotionally hard, where as a human being, if I put on my person hat, um, I would want the outcome to be one way, but applying the law as it's written means the outcome is a different way. Um, and so to put on your judge hat or put on your person hat, but I have committed that I think it works best if I follow what the law says and not go based on my own feelings or preferences. Um, and so, but sometimes you have those cases and you just feel sad and then apply the law. And again, our Texas legislature, you know, meets every two years and they do make changes to our family code and other things on a regular basis. And so that's just my, my place in the system of government. Mm. Well, so Emily, to to pivot a little bit, I mean, we're kind of in a weird moment right now and a very uncertain moment. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your court has been dealing with the current situation where, you know, everyone's being asked to sort of self-isolate and a lot of things are closing down. Like, what are you doing? How is your court dealing with this situation? And, you know, uh, you know, how are, how is the Texas judiciary like dealing with the administration of justice in this kind of unprecedented moment? So on the one hand, it's been very hard, obviously, with all the uncertainty. But on the other hand, it's been sort of an interesting project to work on, right? As a person who loves problem solving and technology and change, this is, you know, right up my alley. Um, I am our local administrative judge for our county, which means I deal with all the, you know, nonsense that has to be done to deal with HR and IT and like the clerk's office and, you know, whatever, all the administrative stuff. So it's been interesting because there's just been a lot of that. I started that role in January and then it feels like, boom, right away, I'm in the middle of this problem solving puzzle. Um, but I have enjoyed it because I think one of the things I said before is as a judge, you don't really get to fix anything, right? You watch a trial, you rule based on the law. If you would have done it differently, that doesn't matter. Um, but in my administrative role, I get to solve problems and help. Um, so it's been fulfilling to be able to, to help and make things better. Um, in Texas, this uh, coronavirus situation all started coincidentally during the week that our school districts were out for spring break. So most of our judges actually had light dockets scheduled because we were all out of the courthouse anyway. Um, and so then it became, what are we going to do the week we come back, which was last week. And so we decided to all work from home Luckily, I had been on the Texas Judicial Council um, working with David Slayton, who's our head of OCA, and he's also on Twitter and very uh, great guy, great Twitter follow. And so we have always already been working on all these technology projects for the state. And so um, locally in Collin County, we decided we were going to do court remotely. None of us have ever done that before. So um, David Slayton helped us negotiate contracts with Zoom to train us, to get up to speed. Uh, an interesting thing with that is we still have open courts, right? The public is entitled to monitor what their government is doing. And so even though we're doing remote hearings by Zoom, we need a way for our public to be able to see what we're doing. 
Um, and so to figure out how we're going to accommodate open courts on a video conference um, has been a unique challenge. Um, just to figure out how to give someone notice, right? Uh, how do you notice a hearing that's being held by video conference? And again, the constables are not serving any subpoenas. And so how can you do court when you can't serve witnesses with subpoenas? People are not physically showing up to the courthouse. They're dialing in with technology. And we have a wide range of tech skills with our attorneys and um, with our pro se people, our self-represented litigants. So um, I would say I was very impressed with how fast everyone was able to shift over to working video conference, considering all the hurdles that were in the way, but we were all motivated to do it in part because of our workload, right? With 2,300 cases, like I can't delay stuff till two months from now because all those days are full, right? I don't know when I'm going to do this work if I don't do it now. Um, so we were very motivated to do it. We've done it. We were also helped because Texas has already switched to 100% electronic e-filing. So all of our court files and all of our court filings and proposed orders and all that were already being handled and processed 100% electronically. So to move me home, really the thing we have to figure out the substitute for is just the face-to-face -face things we did in the courtroom. So my court reporter's on Zoom, I'm on Zoom. She takes a record. I've got an iPad that links to her real time so I can see if she's able to hear, if she's getting the record and I can tell the participants, hold on, slow down, whatever it might be. Um, we figured out a system where everybody can email documents to my coordinator. She'll save them in a Dropbox that my court reporter and I have access to so that we can admit exhibits in a video hearing and then you can screen share to publish them. Um, it's I, I had very low expectations that this was going to work and, and it just has really gone way better than I've expected. And obviously that's not to minimize the trouble that we're all having, um, but I just thought it was going to be a complete abject failure. And actually, I would say we're at like 80 percent. Mm. Well, it's still kind of early in the whole process and everything's really new for everyone. But I wonder if there are aspects of this sort of new reality that you think or hope might persist and maybe even make the administration of justice more effective and efficient once things get back to normal? There were still many areas in our daily workflow where people were walking around with physical documents in like carbon copy triplicate. And um, I'm like allergic to that. So since I've started in 2015, every time I identify one of those that touches me, I figure out a way to change it. But but we still had a lot of places where people were just doing paper-based inefficient systems. And so I think one of the good side effects of this is it is sweeping out some of those cobwebs. And I don't think people will go back when it's, um, when it's, because if you have a system in place that works, why would you ever choose to go back to like inter officing sheets of paper and like attorneys physically dropping them off at the courthouse? That's crazy. That makes no sense. Um, so I think a lot of the stuff that never made sense you know, the, here's what I've noticed about attorneys. They change. They don't adapt to change well. I have found that if I make a change in my court policies, it takes over a year for people to really be bored with it. Um, and we're still, I, I made a change over two years ago and people, attorneys are still coming in and, you know, we're like, well, we don't do that. And they're like, what? That's new. What? Um, so change comes super slow with, with the legal system, with judges, with attorneys. And so unless there's a good reason, you know, we're, we're essentially conservative people. We see risk uh, and we say, well, why change if it's OK now? And I think this situation gave us a powerful motivation to change things and to do things differently and to experiment. And so once we get to the other side of it, I think people won't go back to some of those old, inefficient, terrible paper shuffling ways of doing things because they figured out the new, better way. That was really the stumbling block is. I don't have time to think about doing something a new way, but now that we've all been drugged through it, now we all know how to do it. I think we will do, do more of that. As far as will video hearings continue to happen? I don't know. I've been idly thinking about that this past week on what, if anything, can we bring forward after this is over? I think having witnesses testify by video, if they are in a graphically you know, unreachable place or for some other reason can physically appear in the courthouse, I, I think we will expand our ability to work with witnesses remotely. That could be um, good for everybody. Like, for example, 
if a doctor gets subpoenaed to come testify in court, maybe the thing they're testifying on takes 15 minutes, but they had to cancel their whole day of patients, sit in the hallway for four hours till we reached their case. And there was no real way around that before. And I think we might be a lot more open to saying, have the doctor be on call. And then when we know, hey, in about 30 minutes, we're going to get to you, be in a place where we can reach you by video. That's much more efficient. That's better for their patients. That's better for their business income. Um, And so it makes our justice system much less of a negative burden on the people involved with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like a sensible set of, you know, ways of thinking about uh, dealing with these problems going forward. And I got to say, Emily, uh, Judge Miskell, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And honestly, I think uh, Texas and the Texas judicial system are really fortunate to have a thoughtful, engaged judge like yourself. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me uh, and giving giving me the chance to talk about my little corner of the business. <laughs> I took a ride with little Lucy Brown We went to all the honky-tonks We really got around She's five foot two with eyes of blue And pretty as a queen I didn't know her pop was a city cop And she was just fifteen Good morning, Judge Why do you look so mean, sir? And Mr. Judge What can the charges be? If there's been trouble, I will plead not guilty. It must be someone else. You know it can't be me. I filed my income tax returns and thought I'd save some dough. I cheated just a little bit. I knew they'd never know. I got some money back this year just like I always do. They'll have to catch me before I pay internal revenue. Good morning, Judge. Why do you look so mean, sir? And Mr. Judge, what can the charges be? If there's been trouble, I will plead not guilty. It must be someone else. You know it can't be me. And I, we separated just the other day The last thing that she said to me was Brother, you will pay She said I'd pay her every week I'd better never fail I said before I send a dime I'll die right here in jail Good morning, Judge Why do you look so mean, sir? And Mr. Judge What can the charges be? If there's been trouble, I will plead not guilty. It must be someone else. You know it can't be me.